my topic is spirit, soul, and body. And um, this is kind of a big topic, but I'm going to try to hit the highlights. Uh, it, this is an important thing to understand. Uh, understanding how you function as a three-part being is important. Understanding what God did to those three parts of you at the moment of your salvation is important. Understanding how to manage yourself when you, say, start to get off track or start to go sideways in your Christian life is important because you're not always with other. You need to understand what's going on inside of you in order to correct things when they're going wrong. Um, understanding the process by which Christ is formed in you. You think of Galatians 4.19. Paul says, until Christ be formed in you um, there. And that's, that's the goal. We want Christ formed in us. But how does that happen? Well, understanding the, the function of the spirit, the function of the soul, the function of the body, before we're saved and then after we're saved, it is important because we kind of get some of the mechanics uh, of how this all works. First of all, um, we have to talk about just the simple uh, anatomy. As I said, we are uh, spirit, soul, and body. Get Galatians, I mean, sorry, Genesis chapter 2. You'll see right from the beginning, when God formed Adam, he made him body, or spirit, soul, and body. Look down at uh, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. Get Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, and it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Okay, there's his body. Man is made out of dust, right? And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Well, there's his spirit. And man became a living soul. See, right from the beginning, to be a human, to be a man, is to be a spirit, a soul, and a body. First Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23, Paul says, And I pray your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved. See, he mentions all three parts. For example, you don't have to turn there for time's sake, but Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 makes a very clear distinction between your spirit and your soul. Um, all three are necessary. In fact, Genesis 35, 18 talks about how when the soul leaves the body, that's when you die. See, the body needs the soul. And the soul needs the body because it needs a physical vehicle in a physical world. James chapter 2, the very last verse in the chapter, verse 26, says, when the spirit leaves the body, the body dies. So when the soul leaves the body or the spirit leaves the body, the body's dead. So they rely on each other. All three parts are very, very important. Okay, so we're going to go over what these parts are. So your spirit, your spirit makes you God conscious. That is the purpose of your spirit. The purpose of your spirit is to respond to God. Turn with me to the Gospel of John chapter 4. Go with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 4, and verse 24. John 4, 24. And also get Romans 8, uh, Romans 8 please. John 4, 24, and Romans 8. And we'll go to John first. Jesus Christ says this in John 4, 24. He says, God is spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You see that God is a spirit. The Lord Jesus Christ, the, the, the second member of the Godhead, is the only member of the Godhead who has a physical, he put on flesh. But God, the, he's a spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Notice uh, Romans chapter 8 and verse 16. See, what we're going to see here, and, and there's a lot of other verses we could go to, but spirits communicate with spirits because they're of the same essence. Okay? 
Romans 8, 16 says, the Spirit, notice capital S, itself, beareth witness with our spirit. That's our human spirit, that we are the children of God. See, that the Holy Spirit, he communicates with our spirit. Notice he doesn't say the Holy Spirit communicates with our flesh. It doesn't say the Holy Spirit communicates with our soul. He communicates with our spirit. Turn back a couple pages to Romans 1. Remember a minute ago we looked at John 4, 24, where Christ said those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Look at Romans 1 and verse 9. Notice the Apostle Paul says about himself, he says, Romans 1, 9, he says, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son. So you see there, your spirit... God gave you a spirit because he's spirit, and spirits communicate with spirits. So you, the, the purpose of your spirit is to respond to God. Okay, and we'll get into more of that in just a little bit. But you're also, you also have a soul. Now, your soul makes you self-conscious. Okay, your soul makes you self-conscious. When you think about you, when you have that inner dialogue in your mind and you're thinking about the deepest part of you who you really are that's your soul think about this one day you're going to physically die unless the rapture comes of course and then you're going to be changed and get a body like unto his glorious body hopefully that comes sooner than later but if not you're going to physically die well when you physically die do you stop being you no you are your soul and your soul is eternal it's immaterial, but it's every bit as real as, as your physical body. Okay, so your soul makes you self-conscious. Your soul is you. And your body, of course, is a physical entity to operate in a physical world. It makes you world-conscious. It's how you interact in the physical world. So, again, the purpose of your spirit is to respond to God, who is spirit. Now, let's talk a little bit more about the spirit, and then we'll go back to the soul a little bit. I, I was going to do some drawing, but I saw some other speakers try it, and I said, hey, if they can't pull it off, I, I'm not even going to try. So, uh, anyways, go to the Gospel of John chapter 6. Gospel of John chapter 6 and 1 Corinthians 2. John 6 and 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Remember a minute ago, we, we, we saw that verse in Romans 8, 16, where, where the Holy Spirit communicates with our spirit. Um, am I in John 2? John I'm sorry, did I say John 2? I meant John 6. My bad. John 6 and verse 63. John 6, 63. It says... It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, this is Christ speaking, of course, the words that I speak unto you, notice, they are spirit and they are life. The words that the Lord Jesus Christ spoke are spiritual words. They are spiritual nutrition. Now, those words floated away a long time ago, except guess what? They got written down. That's why the doctrine of inspiration and preservation is so vital to believe, to understand and believe so that you know you have something. You know what you have in your hands, and we have it in English in the King James Bible. So when Christ says, my words, or the words I speak unto you, they are spirit, the words that I have in this book right here are spiritual words. They are spiritual nutrition. And it's what the Holy Spirit uses as he teaches me teaches my spirit. Look over at 1 Corinthians 2 on this same notion about spiritual interaction. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11. Now, uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 11, down through 14, he says, For what man knoweth the things of a man, 
save the spirit of a man which is in him. You see there, your spirit has capacity for knowledge. See that word knoweth? It has capacity to understand things, to think. It knows things. Reading on in the verse, even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God. Why? Next word, that. That's a purpose word. That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. See, we got, we've received the Spirit of God so that we can know the things freely given to us of God. The Holy Spirit ultimately is our teacher. But where does he teach? He teaches our spirit, spirit to spirit. Notice verse 13. Which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth. That was the problem with the Corinthians, you know. They, they, they got off track into man's wisdom, human wisdom, human viewpoint. The Galatians got off into legalism, the Corinthians into human viewpoint, human wisdom. And Paul's bringing them back into God's wisdom. Verse 13 again, sorry. Verse 13. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. Notice, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Spiritual things, like Bible verses, with spiritual, with my spirit. Spirit to spirit. Notice verse 14, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Now, that unsaved man, that's talking about the unsaved man. The natural man is a man who has not been regenerated. He is spiritually dead, although active. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, 2, and 3. And also get Titus chapter 3. Ephesians 2 and Titus chapter 3. Ephesians 2 and verse 1. Now this is talking about the personal, individual time passed before you got saved. Okay, notice verse 1. And you hath he quickened. That just means to be made alive. Who were, so in your past, dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein, in time past, ye walked. Notice that's an action where you're actually doing something, but you were dead. According to the, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit, little less, that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation. There's another action word. See, you're spiritually dead, although you're active according to the course of this world. So you're spiritually interacting. It's just not with the right spirit. There's a spiritual course you're following, but it's the spirit little less. That's the natural man Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians 2. You're spiritually active, but you're spiritually dead. Now, you, now you can say, that doesn't make any sense. Well, turn the page real quick. Ephesians 4 and verse 18. There's a phrase in here that describes what spiritual... Spiritually dead people are. Notice the middle of the verse. That phrase, alienated from the life of God. That's what to be spiritually dead is to be alienated from the life of God. You can be active, but you're active according to the course of Satan. Although you're, but you're alienated from the life of God. That is, you're spiritually dead. Now, something radical happens the moment you get saved. Turn over to Titus chapter 3. Now this is the work of the Holy Spirit here. Well, the whole Godhead's involved, of course. But we're going to jump right into the verse, just for time's sake. Uh, uh, Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. He says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done. Well, golly. I'm, I'm, verse 3 it talks about how, what we were doing before we got saved. Verse 4, the, the, the kindness of God appeared toward us. And then verse 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. 
That word regeneration there, re, means again, to generate, to give life to. You see that? To re, to again, life, to give life. The Holy Spirit, what happened the moment you trusted Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit gave life to your dead spirit. Your dead spirit was no longer alienated from the life of God. Your dead spirit became alive, and now you're able to receive the things of God. You're able to receive spiritual nutrition. Jesus Christ said, the words I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Romans 8, 2 says, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. There's life in Christ and there's life in his words. And when you get saved, your dead, your, your dead spirit becomes alive and now you're able to receive that nutrition, that spiritual nutrition, that instruction. And you're able to, to, to grow in that way. Okay? Now, go back to Ephesians 4. We were just there a second ago. And I want you to see uh, the rest of the verse there. Ephesians 4. We're going to read verse 17 and 18. And we're going to transition into talking about the soul. I, I, we're just going to try to skip them out over the mountaintops here on, on, on these things. Ephesians 4, verse 17. He says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth... Walk not as other Gentiles walk, that would be the unsaved Gentiles, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. Why? Notice, because of the blindness of their heart. You see that heart there? That's talking about their soul. Usually when, well, we'll look at some other verses, but... You want to link that darkened with that heart in verse 18, the blindness that's in their soul. Before you were saved, your spirit was dead and your soul was darkened. It was, there was blindness in there. Go back to Romans chapter 1. He uses a similar description in Romans chapter 1. And again, just jumping right in the context to, to save time here, verse 21. Romans 1, 21 says, because that when they, this is talking about those unsaved folks long ago, but tr very true of unsaved people today. Because that when they knew God, that is referring back up to verse uh, 19 and 20, that God was able to be known because of what was in them, their conscience and the witness of creation. Verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. You see that their foolish heart was darkened. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? But the heart also has the capacity to trust God. It can believe. That darkened soul, God has given capacity to it that it can trust. Look at Romans 10 and get Romans 6. Romans 10 first. Romans 10, 10, A, the first part of the verse. So the heart is darkened in the unsaved man, but notice here, 10, 10, A. For with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. Well, that's talking about his soul there. Look back at chapter 6, verse 17. Romans six seventeen. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, that's before ye got saved, but ye have obeyed, notice, from the heart, that form of doctrine which was delivered you. See, you have a function in your soul, which is the will. Your will, your personal volition, is a function of your soul. And that, every man has one, has a will. God put it in there. And that is where you determine whether you're going to trust Christ or not. That's the deep, you know, that's the deep part of you. That's where your will resides. And, and, and your heart, you can trust Christ and his finished work for you from your heart, and that's what God sees, and that's when God will save you, just like that. 
And what happens to that darkened soul the minute you trust Christ, just like your spirit became alive by the work of the Holy Spirit, that regeneration, your soul goes from being darkened to being light. Get a couple passages with me. Get 2 Corinthians 4 and Ephesians 5. 2 Corinthians 4, verse uh, 6. And Ephesians 5, verse 8. Second Corinthians four and verse six. He says, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined where? In our hearts. To give light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The light was shined in the darkness of our soul, our heart. Look at Ephesians five. In verse 8, Paul says, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Notice, ye are light in the Lord. The ye is you, the real you, your soul, not your flesh. Your flesh is still a mess. Your flesh can't please God. Ye are light in the Lord. Your soul is light in the Lord. Hence, walk as children of light. See, your soul, now you can walk in the light. Psalm 119, verse 130 says, The entrance of thy word giveth light. And that's what happens in, in, in your soul when you, when you trust the word of God. Now, um, we, we, we spoke a minute ago about, your, about the will the will that you have, whether you're going to trust Christ or not. The will you have that determines whether you're going to serve God once you get saved. And there's a whole lot we're skipping over, of course. But we got to talk about some of the mechanics of, what, of, of how this works. So, as we said, the moment you get saved, your dead spirit becomes alive. Your soul, your darkened soul becomes light. For the light shines in. And your body goes from being alive to positionally being dead. So it's like everything gets changed. Come with me to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2 and Philippians 3. I feel like I'm racing the clock here. Colossians 2 and Philippians chapter 3. The mechanics of, of, of how all these things get changed in you, of the this, this spiritual surgery that God does to change you so that you can function differently so you can serve him instead of walking in the course of this world. So you can serve him instead of walking just to serve your flesh. These are a couple of the things he did here. Look at Colossians 2 and verse 11. He says, In whom, that's in Christ, also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made, notice, without hands. That's a spiritual circumcision. It's not a, something a man does. That's something God does. In putting off the body, notice, putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. This act, this circumcision, made without hands, of course, it did something. It put off the body of the sins of the flesh. See, before you got saved, your soul, who you are, was enslaved to the passions and whims of your flesh. But the moment you trust Christ as your Savior, you are spiritually circumcised. That is, your soul is cut loose from the domination of the, of the flesh. Now, you still have the flesh because the flesh is your vehicle. Your soul and your spirit need a physical vehicle to operate in a physical world. But God fixed you so that your flesh doesn't run the show. And one of the two ways he did that is this spiritual circumcision. Look at Philippians 3. Look at Philippians 3 in verse 3. Paul says, jumping right into the context, of course, Paul says in Philippians 3.3, 3, For we are the circumcision, which worship God in the flesh. No, 
which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. See that we are the circumcision. What is, what is the mess that the, the heart of the message of circumcision is death to the flesh. It's always been death. That's what it's been since Genesis 17. Well, we're in the dispensation of grace now. Now it's not about a physical circumcision, but it's about a spiritual circumcision where, whereby your flesh is cut off. God says, I don't accept the works of your flesh. Just like he said that to Abraham. He says it to us too. I don't accept the works of your flesh. So he fixed us in such a way that our flesh doesn't dominate our life. And it, it, isn't, it isn't what's controlling us. Go over to Romans chapter 6 and Colossians 2. Hold Colossians 2 and get Romans 6. We just got to look at these real quick. I know some of the other men have taught, touched on this section here, Romans 6, 7, and 8, quite a bit already, and that's wonderful because this is really where we get a lot of that, the understanding for our grace walk. Look at Romans 6, verse 3 and 4. He says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Now that word baptism, you want to think identification. This is, as Pastor Jordan said last night, you don't think water, you know, when you see the word. There's a lot of different baptisms in your Bible. This one is a death baptism <laughs> and a resurrection baptism too, by the way. You're, you're, you're placed into Christ. This is where you're placed into him and you're identified with him so intimately that his death is your death and his resurrection is your resurrection. So you're, you're, you're identified, verse 3, into his death. Notice verse 4, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Well, whose life is that? That's, that's Christ's life. That's Christ's resurrection life. See, that's that life I got from the Holy Spirit when I got regenerated. This baptism here fixes me so that I can walk in newness of life instead of walking in the energy of the spirit, instead of the energy of the flesh, because my flesh is crucified. How do I know that? I know it by faith. I'm twice dead. My flesh has been cut off, spiritual circumcision, and I've been spiritually baptized into Christ's death. God has fixed me so that when I sin, I sin because I want to sin. I don't have to. I can walk in newness of spirit, newness of life. And, and then we go on and read about how we can, how that, that frees us up to serve God. So what happens, uh, what happens is, is I can walk in the spirit. Not letting my, using my body, using my flesh as a vehicle, but not letting the whims of the flesh control me. So that I can walk in agape love and produce fruit that God's justice accepts. And now I'm producing fruit with my life. What, generated from me? No, generated from the Spirit of God. From that soul where, well, we're going to get, we're going to move on in this. Okay, we're, we're doing okay time-wise here. Now, notice, look down at verse, uh, we're in Romans 6, right? Look down at verse 6. Let's talk about the body just for a minute. The body here. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. And that's that, that's that death baptism we just read about in verse 3 and 4 there. Why? That the body of sin might be destroyed. Well, why would he do that? That henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. See that positionally speaking, you're dead. Christ is your life. Notice it says the body of sin. That's a, that's a good description of what that old man is. It's a body of sin. And uh, that body of sin, that old man, is a real tricky guy. All right? Sin resides, the seat of sin, if we can say it this way, resides in your flesh. Sin resides in your flesh. 
Now, God has fixed you, so, so flesh isn't the dominating force. So sin is not the dominating force. That's what Romans 6 is all about. It's not the do- it, He set you free from it dominating you and, and, and it having to, to run you. But that old man is real tricky, especially when it comes to religion. Your spirit's been made alive. Your soul's been enlightened. Your body is dead. And when he talks about your body being dead, he's not interested in any of the works of your flesh anymore. And that's what the sanctification process is all about, is us learning to walk in the spirit, learning how that works, learning how grace functions in our inner man and works out. See, we don't live from the outside in. We walk by faith, not by sight. But that, that flesh that you have because you still have a, you still need a vehicle is tricky because there's a human good side too. We all know the Romans one side, the, the, the adultery, the fornication, the drunkenness, the, you know, all the, the, the nasty stuff of the world. We all, we know that's not acceptable to God, but it's, it's difficult for us sometimes to, to distinct, to, 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 to really believe, maybe I should say that he doesn't accept the good works of my flesh. What was the name of the tree that Adam and Eve took the fruit from when they fell in the garden? It was the, it was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? That's the root. If you want to have an understanding of your sin nature, that's where it came from. It came from a tree that has the knowledge of good and evil. Human good, human evil. Your flesh is capable of both. God's not interested in either, which is the, what the message of circumcision is. Um, the world. The world feels tries to feel good about itself when it does like, uh, you know, Social media, everything has to be public now. You know, oh, I'm giving money to this. Cha- uh, a celebrity gives money to a charity. Got to make sure it's on camera for everybody to see, right? Uh, philanthropy and, and and these different different ways in which uh, people really feel good about themselves. What happens is people get off in the human evil, and then to make up for it, they go to the human good. Even Christians think that way, often. What we need to do is we need to recognize what God has done in our inner man. He's given us a completely new resource out of which to live. He's not interested in the good side of our flow, the human good that we produce, or the human evil. He's interested in Christ living his life through us. In fact, that's the very purpose of our ambassadorship here on earth. Until we go home, our purpose is to put Christ on display, not self. The best Nathan can do is to do human good, but guess what happens in my, I get puffed up, I feel real good about me, and you know what, I'm probably better than you, in that moment, in my own mind, and I'm feeling real good about myself, see that, God doesn't accept that, that's not something, that's not fruit his justice can accept, under grace, we walk in that agape love, and we do produce the fruit, because it's Christ in us, and his, it's, we walk in newness of spirit, newness of life, and that is fruit that the justice of God accepts, and that's what will be the gold, silver, and precious stones at the judgment seat of Christ. That's what's going to be worth something. So we need to spend our lives understanding the flow of how God gets in us, and then Christ comes out of us. So we got about we got about ten minutes here. Okay. So the moment you got saved, now let me say another thing. Depending on how old you were when you got saved, I know I was, you know, well, whatever. But before the fall, you could, you know, Adam and Eve, before they fell in the garden, they could always trust their emotions because God gave us emotions so that it would, it would, we, you know, we feel something and that causes us to act. But when we, but when sin entered, it, you know, our, our emotions are often, are often all messed up and they, they lead us erroneously and they don't lead us according to the will of God. So what we need to do is we need to walk. How does Paul t- talk to us? And, and how does he teach us in his epistles? Does he say things like, when you feel like this, then maybe do this? Or, no, he gives us the facts. 
He tells us who we are in Christ, and then we are to walk in that reality. We need to skip straight to faith. That is God's order. We skip straight to faith, and then we walk in that reality. And then we let the, the emotions come in behind. All right? Um, so what do we have here? We have, we have a spirit that was dead, but has been made alive, regenerated, given life. And our spirit is where we receive the things of God. We receive his word, which is spirit, and the Holy Spirit teaches us and teaches our spirit. And that, in your spirit, is that's, that's, the, that's where your new nature is. And then you have a soul. Your soul was darkened, but the light shined in the moment you trusted Christ. Now you have light. By the way, get a couple passages with me. Get Luke chapter 6 and Mark chapter 7. Get Luke chapter 6 and Mark chapter 7. Look what the Lord Jesus Christ here says about the soul. Get Luke 6, verse 45. He says over in uh, the uh, in Proverbs, it says that the issues of life come out of the heart. Right? Another, uh, another proverb says in Proverbs 23, he says, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Uh, we're, we're talking about your soul here. Look at Luke 6 and verse 45. A good man out of the good tread, this is Christ speaking, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. You see, you can bring out either one. But it comes out of your heart. For the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaketh. speaketh. So what's ever in his heart, whether it's good or evil... That's what comes out. That's the source of what comes out of his mouth. And notice that word abundance there. There's a high storage capacity in, in the soul. There's a lot of stuff in there and a lot of room. Look, he says something kind of similar over in Mark chapter 7. Going head to head with the Pharisees here, toe to toe. He says in verse 21, Mark 7, 21, for from within... Out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within and defile the man. You see, what's in yours? You can see from these verses, and I wish we had more time, but you can see from these verses that it's what's in your soul. It's what's in your heart that's what's going to come out of you. See, you function out of your soul. You have a spirit, you have a body, you have a soul. What you really function out of is your soul. Your souls have the light turned on. But you receive God's word in your spirit and your flesh is dead. So, in closing, this is how we want to grow in our Christian lives. This is how we want to have Christ formed in us, Galatians 4.19. We want to form Christ in our soul so that Christ is what comes out of us. Christ's spiritual, his word. Paul says in Timothy, the form of sound words he says in Galatians, Christ be formed in you. Here's how Christ is formed in you. You take God's word in. He said, Christ said, my, my words are spirit. And they're like, we take the Holy Spirit teaches. We take them in in our spirit. Okay? And then we have a decision to make. You know, we, we're either going to believe him or not. Last, last passage we're going to turn to. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. So we take, we, we hear God's word. Now, now, God's word has the, has the capacity to work effectually in us, but there's a condition. 
1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 13, Paul says, For this cause also, or yeah, for this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. Notice the last phrase, which effectually, that means it's going to get the job done, worketh also in you that believe. The condition is believing. When you hear the word of God, it will work effectually in you if you believe it. See how it's a function of your will, whether you're going to believe it or not? All right? So you receive the word of God. Here's how it works. You receive the word of God in your spirit. You choose to believe it or not. If you believe it, it goes to work. You believe it. You think on it. You meditate about it. You pray about it. You implement it. Apply it to your daily life. You know what happens as you do that? It's transferred from your spirit down into your soul. And you function out of your soul. So what's being for- Christ is being formed in you. And then, you know, as you spiritually grow, what you start to notice is that Christ starts coming out of you. Because that's what, isn't that what Christ said in Luke 6 and Matthew 7? And What's in you is going to come out. So it's his attitude that can start to come out of you. It's his mind, his thinking, his viewpoint on life. And now we're fulfilling the purpose of our ambassadorship here. Have you ever heard somebody say, that guy over there, you know, he's got a head knowledge, but no heart knowledge. What they're technically saying is that guy has a lot of information in his spirit, but none in his soul. Because they, you know what his soul is still full of? Self. He never made the choice of his will to replace self with Christ. So we have a decision every day. We can build Christ in us a little bit more by walking by faith in his word, by believing it, taking it in our spirit, transferring that thing into our soul, and walking in the joy thereof. Um, The thing that transfers it is faith. Faith is what grows us. That's all really God asks from us, is just to believe what he says. He's going to do the work in us as we walk by faith in his word, knowing that you need it, believing it, walking in it, and depending on it. Christ said, I can do nothing without my father. I butchered his words there a little bit, but, you know, obviously, us being much less than Christ, how much more are we not dependent upon God's word? So, as we take in God's word, and Christ has formed in us, The Holy Spirit has a ministry. He energizes it. He stirs it up. And and, and that ends up being what comes out of us. And that's the Christian life in a nutshell, guys. It's Christ. And and we we are his vehicle on this earth until we get taken home. And our ambassadorship is over. All right. It is uh, 246, 446 your time. So my time is up. Thank you very much.